Hey Gengar gang, what is going on? My name is Ryan, this is the Analytic Gengar, and welcome to another video. In today's video, friends, we talk about the different types of market players that are at play in today's Pokemon card trading card game market. Specifically, we speak about stores, resellers, flippers, and scalpers, the differences and similarities between all of them, as well as what helps to make any one of these particular parties a quote-unquote morally bad or morally ambiguous player in the overall hobby. So in today's video, what I really wanted to do is break down the definitions for you. Obviously, many people have already sort of chimed in on the definitions and what they think and their judgments on stores, resellers, scalpers, and flippers. And in today's video, obviously, I plan on doing the same, but as I always say, this channel isn't just regurgitating information that's already out there. Um, and so in order to sort of build off of that, I've also developed a way of looking at the different types of sellers that we're currently seeing in the market and really kind of understanding what makes them similar, what makes them different, and what are some of the key defining characteristics that you can look for. So hopefully, as you navigate buying and selling Pokemon cards in the future, you can think about the way that you're approaching different buyers and sellers and understand which of the four buckets they fit in. Now, the one thing I will say is obviously all of the definitions that I'll share with you today are primarily my own thoughts and based on my own interactions, experiences, and my own conclusions that I've drawn based on different experiences. And so it's important to realize that although I call them one thing, the definition technically may not line up with another one of your favorite YouTubers, but that's totally fine. Um, even though we may use a different word, as long as we agree on the meaning, I think that's what realistically is the most important component. And whether or not you choose to use my vernacular or someone else's vernacular really doesn't matter. But as long as we agree on the definition, like I said, um, that's really what's going to get us to agree and be able to compare apples to apples here. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started with our very first definition, which is a store. So, you know, a store, quote unquote, is any Pokemon buyer and seller who is actively in the business of, you know, buying and selling Pokemon cards. A couple of the key characteristics that define and establish a store is that they are business oriented. They are very clearly doing this to make a profit. They may be doing this as a primary means of, you know, making money to live. And, you know, obviously it's a regular ongoing activity. The other thing is that it requires a storefront, meaning you may see a store have a website, have a YouTube presence, have a Instagram, a, U a eBay page, as well as their own website, their own domain. Chances are they have a warehouse or a storage facility where they also keep the majority of their inventory. And one of the other things is that they have a dedicated inventory. So these are the types of folks who receive large shipments of pallets of cards, they have to go through that stuff, they have to package and ship that stuff to their customers, etc, etc. Now, although I call it a store, obviously there are several individuals who are individuals that meet this um, particular definition as well. So when you think of some of the larger YouTubers like PokeRev and TCA Gaming, they're obviously stores, at least from the perspective of this definition, right? So they really fit into this really nice category because Realistically, you know, they are business driven and have the infrastructure in place to entertain large volumes of orders as well as fulfilling those orders through their own inventory. So obviously this particular area, this is what we've seen in the past and there's really no, you know, special differentiator among them. There are many stores that sell Pokemon cards. The only difference is, is that nowadays what we are seeing is that some of these stores are having to increase their prices as distributor prices rise as well. Um, the next definition that I wanted to go over is the reseller. So resellers are individuals. Um, and when I say individuals, I mean, typically they're going to be one person or, you know, maybe like one person acting on behalf of a larger community. And what they do is they also... Um, buy and sell Pokemon cards, but one of the key 
differences between a reseller and a store is that they lack the infrastructure, meaning they don't typically carry large amounts of inventory, they don't have a dedicated website, Instagram, YouTube page, etc., etc. Um, and although they could have some of this stuff, what really differentiates them is the frequency. Um, they are opportunistic in the way that they sell cards. So one of the ways that I like to paraphrase that definition is to say that resellers behave more like investors. They buy low and sell high, and they do so with infrequency. You know, they'll make decisions based on their own investment goals, they'll make decisions based on their own needs and finances, and you know, they will buy and sell when the market is right. Unlike a store, which will buy and sell basically throughout the entire system, and throughout all of the different phases of an economic recession or a economic um, growth pattern. And the idea here is that, you know, what separates a reseller is that they're really just doing it when they need to, to generate some extra funds versus a store, which is doing this as a dedicated means of business. Bear in mind, both of these types of entities, a store and a reseller, are really business oriented, right? Realistically, I consider myself in this particular category, and although the word reseller doesn't necessarily perhaps capture the true definition, I didn't think investor also sounded correct either. But when you look at it, right, um, I very frequently say on this channel, um, I use and often look for opportunities to buy Pokemon cards that will increase in value over time. And although I may not have a true passion or a true love for that particular set, there are many sets that I do have a passion and true love for. And the hope is that the appreciation in value for the cards that I don't love, I'll be able to take and use to purchase the cards that I do love. And realistically, that's what this particular category is all about. We are opportunistic in the way that we behave. We really seek to maximize the amount of value we can gain so that we can pursue what we love. And it's business or at least investment oriented because although we may not be selling with the ongoing frequency of a store, we do still have the intention of making a profit as well as using that profit to really help better our own collection. And so it's a very interesting area because it combines the business orientation of a store with the you know investment-like mindset and strategy that will help us to develop our collection for the future. So next up on my list of definitions is going to be the flipper. And flippers are an interesting group. Now, flippers are what I like to call when you get a chance type sellers. So flippers are the types of people who are going to walk into a store, see some stuff in stock, they're gonna grab some of the stuff, and they're gonna try to make a couple bucks on it. Very similar to a reseller, flippers will at least attempt when the opportunity arises to take advantage of you know market demand, market supply, and make a couple of bucks. So in that particular case, they are very clearly opportunistic in the same way that a reseller is right as a reseller you behave like an investor you buy low you sell high you take the money um, and same thing with a flipper you buy low or you buy at MSRP and you sell slightly higher with the intention of making a profit and that is the key difference between a reseller and a flipper when you're business oriented the intention is making a profit yes but it's obviously through the lens of making that profit and reinvesting it or using it to develop and build your collection. The idea is that once that profit is generated, it tends to stay within the hobby in one way, shape, or form. With flippers, however, it's profit-oriented only, meaning the money they make will very frequently find a way to exit the hobby at some point in the future. So I buy something, I flip it on Facebook Marketplace, and I put the money in my pocket as opposed to buying and selling additional Pokemon cards and creating more value for the hobby as a whole. So flippers really do behave like this. Now the one thing I will say about flippers is that they don't quite rise to the level of scalpers, which are our next category. So scalpers are an interesting one, and obviously there are many definitions for what a scalper is. I believe the term originates from the scalping of computer products, but obviously it's gone to you know basically cover every different type of 
consumable good that was in high demand over the past couple of years. I've heard the term scalper tossed out for every single type of hobby, as well as PC parts, as well as a variety of other things like PlayStation 5s. So what is a scalper? Well, a scalper is basically an extreme flipper. Um, scalpers are individuals who will actively go out of their way to manipulate and set prices via the constriction of supply. And this is an important thing to note. A flipper won't constrict supply. Flippers will grab some and try to flip it because they know it's in high demand. But what separates a flipper from a scalper is that scalpers will go out of their way to buy everything on store shelves purely with the intention of then being the only person in the market who has that stuff. Now that might sound a little crazy because you might say to yourself, well, Ryan, if a scalper hits my one target, why don't I just go to another one? Well, that's because there's another scalper scalping that target. And so this happens on a very microeconomic scale. But the effect is effectively a lot of people who buy up all of the stuff and they then turn around and set the price. And although they may not realize it, by posting things on eBay or Facebook Marketplace, they also set the price artificially high and create the pattern for other scalpers to follow. So as an example, when I go to target number one and I buy up everything and list the Hidden Fates tins at $50 a piece, then the next scalper in the town across from ours who does the same thing can list his at $49 or $51 or match my price exactly. But you get the idea. The idea is that we will constrict the supply and then specifically go out of our way to influence the market price because we're the only people with supply. And even if it is on a very small scale, it obviously expands very quickly because of the widespread information that's available on the internet today. So. The other key component of being a scalper is that, similar to a store actually, they require infrastructure. Now, for a store, you carry inventory, you have a website, you know, obviously there's tons of things that you have to do to be a successful store. Uh, for scalpers, although they don't have a store or carry inventory, scalpers do have their own type of infrastructure. Specifically, scalpers typically have patterns. They will find out when restocks occur and they will go ahead and they will buy out everything at a restock. That is a pattern that is part of the infrastructure of their scalping because they need to find out when dis when distributors go to stores, they need to find out when restocks occur and they need to work to get all the restock. Again, one of the key components of being a scalper is supply. If you can't control supply, you're no longer a scalper because there's other supply out there, there are market alternatives, and the worst thing that can possibly happen is you are a scalper trying to scalp prices, and there are market alternatives available at MSRP, meaning you left some stuff on store shelves, and therefore, why would I buy from you when I could just walk into Target and just pick up a Hidden Fates tin off the store shelf? So for scalpers, they really do need to invest significantly in that type of infrastructure. They need to develop that pattern and whether it be waking up at six o'clock and camping outside Walmart or even buying or developing their own bots that will buy out internet sites. The infrastructure required is, while not similar, it is in a similar pattern to what a store has to do. They both have to establish some sort of standard operating procedure and that takes a little bit more work than what a flipper might do. So with all of those definitions now set in mind, I present to you the seller matrix. So here you can see on screen basically everything that I just said. You'll see that um, there are many similarities and patterns that go across, right? So as you're looking at the major square that says store, reseller, scalper, flipper, you already have the definitions. And then what you'll see is the lines that sort of separate the different pathways. So obviously, as I'd mentioned, stores and scalpers require infrastructure, right? They have to dedicate a significant amount of resources to being successful. For stores, they need websites, they need advertising, they need major amounts of shipping and warehousing ability. For scalpers, they need bots and established patterns in order to be able to successfully constrict supply. Um, resellers and flippers, they need to be opportunistic, right? They don't necessarily do this on an ongoing basis, but they do have the ability to do so when they get a chance. And when they do, you know, they behave like an investor. They buy low, they sell high, they maximize profit, and they use it for a variety of reasons. 
Speaking of which, if you're profit-oriented, which is what scalpers and flippers are, the money tends to leave our hobby. So realistically, scalpers and flippers are only here to make a couple bucks on something that's in high demand, and what they do is they then take that money and put it in their pocket. They don't necessarily reinvest it into the hobby. For business-oriented entities like stores and resellers, obviously the money either circles back into the hobby or is part of an ongoing effort to support the hobby. So stores like, you know, TCA Gaming, um, Safari Zone, what they do is they are literally in the business of buying and selling Pokemon cards, and they do that with ongoing frequency. So the intention is that, you know, they'll be here today, they'll be here tomorrow, they'll be here a year from now. And that's the whole point, is that they'll always be Pokemon card sellers. You give them your money and they make a profit, but you know at the end of the day, they're also going to be here offering you product today, tomorrow, and for the foreseeable future. And resellers kind of do the same thing. They, they are quite literally the Pokemon card investors. But they also actively collect as opposed to flippers. So what they do is, you know, while they may not do it with the same frequency as stores, they buy and sell Pokemon cards, they make some money, but that money stays in our hobby. So they invest in the things they love, they pursue the passion projects that they love, and they really kind of create value even if it is a little less frequently than what a store might do. So with that said, friends, that is the matrix that I have come up with. Now, obviously there are tons of different experiences that have influenced this, and I've really tried to articulate each of these points pretty well. Um, but if you think there is something else that I should be considering, please feel free to let me know that down below in the comments. Um, briefly, to cover the idea of what is, or who is the bad guy, um, I think what we need to first do is define morality, right? And I think negative market practices really define the morality of any of these types of sellers. Because realistically, I don't necessarily know that we can say that stores, resellers, and flippers are bad. Personally, in my experiences, only the scalper is bad because the scalper is using negative market practices. They are constricting supply in order to be successful. A flipper, you know, all they're really going to do is say like, hey, ship and tip or ship plus, you know, a certain percentage. And ship and tip for anyone who doesn't know is basically saying, hey, can I get like, you know, a couple of dollars for my own time? I went to Walmart secretly. I'm just a baseball guy, but I saw some Pokemon. So if anybody wants it, pay shipping and pay, um, you know, pay like 20% tip, which is like a standard restaurant tip. And I'll be happy to ship it to you. And realistically, although I, you know, although I'm cautious of calling flippers good guys, there are some flippers who might be. And the reason for that is because if products in low supply and, you know, they saw something and they're just trying to get it out to the market or to a larger market, then yeah, why not? You, like, you know what I mean? They're actually doing a service because realistically what they're doing is making Pokemon cards more available. Um, and especially when you're competing then against scalpers who might be a little bit less willing to negotiate price, um, a flipper's 20%, it might actually be cheap compared to what a scalper is selling for. So with that said, friends, thanks again for checking out today's video. I do hope this video, if anything, leaves you with a better understanding um, of obviously the definitions, which I'm sure you've heard from other YouTube channels, but also what separates um, this particular content is the similarities that you're going to see between the different individuals. I think it's really important to see and acknowledge that because at the end of the day, those differences and those similarities are what are going to help you to actively seek to do business with or avoid doing business with certain individuals. If you see all the telltale characteristics of a scalper, avoid at all costs. If you see the telltale signs of a reseller or a store, you might want to support them because realistically, they are kind of the backbone of this community when it comes to the economics of it all. And for flippers, you really have to kind of you know, take a look and see where they fall. Are they closer to a scalper in that they're more, you know, actively seeking to manipulate? Or are they more close to resellers in that, you know, they're good people, they're not from the hobby, but you know, they're, they're just trying to make a quick buck. And frankly, they're bringing something to you that otherwise you don't have a market alternative for. Um, that should be the main driver as to why you support them or not. So with all that said, friends, I will stop talking now, but thank you again for checking out another video. As I always say, you could have been anywhere on the internet, but you chose to spend some time with me and that means the world. As always, if you're not already part of the Gengar gang, feel free to subscribe to the channel and hit that 
that bell notification to stay up to date on new videos coming out every single week. Other than that, friends, let me know if you have any questions down below, and otherwise, we will talk soon. Peace.